Hello, Guardians. Welcome back to Tower Casuals, the Destiny podcast. I am your returning host, Corey Deering, and alongside me, as always, is the hunter extraordinaire, the Jotun Toten, the Dead Man Tales shooting Josh Finney. Hi. Hi, Josh. Corey, I'm so glad you're back. I'm, the Reign of Terror has officially come to an end. I'm glad. I'm happy to be back. Dude, I've been thinking about... God. I, about... Okay, so the first two weeks I was off, I was like, yeah, this is kind of nice. Got a little break. At the end of that two weeks, I was getting the itch, and it's been like four weeks now, and I'm like, I, want, I, I need to have some sort of like friendly adult interaction that's not like me and my wife talking about the kids or trying to talk over the kids and i'm just like oh man man josh it's my first show back i'm very excited i'm very excited how how was hosting uh it, it was great we had we had some great guest appearances from uh Nerd Generalist from Colonel Panic and from A1 Johnny to come in. We kept trying to fill that Titan spot. Nerd mm. and I were holding auditions and just, mm. you know, n- nobody could quite mm. replicate the magic. We went to the Dollar Store Titan. We went to the Target Titan. We eventually had to just come back around to Ikea, man. Mm. 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 We didn't give any, anybody uh, the Walmart Titan because that was just rude. Mm. That is rude. That is it's very rude. I don't know if that's rude or if dollar store is ruder, but yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Very good shows though. I listened while I was away, and uh, I gotta tell you, that person, the the couple people who messaged me and said that Nerd Generalist was made the show better, was very rude. Not wrong, but you're rude. Don't like you. Go away, Omar. That's your name called you out <laughs> so anyways man josh i gotta tell you i played some destiny but i have this is the, like in, during the last month i played more games other than destiny than i have i think in like the last year <laughs> it was, it was it unbelievable was unbelievable i gotta tell you though i'm pretty get this poser out of here i gotta tell you though i'm pretty obsessed with outriders right now <laughs> And I know that you have mixed feelings and a complicated relationship with Outriders right now, but I played post patch. Like complicated relationship with Outriders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, dude. As soon as I started playing, I'm like, man, I know I'm not going to be on a show for like two weeks, but I need to talk about this game. Anybody want to talk about it? Anybody? No. Okay. Okay. But it's okay. I got some people at work to play it, and we've been talking about it, so I kind of got it out of the way. So. I hate you. I hate you so much. <laughs> Dude, Outriders is like it's weird because in so many ways it's the game Destiny wants to be. Mm-hmm. But thank God it's not. Mm-hmm. It's weird. Like, it's the most bland fucking color palette I think I've ever seen in a show. It reminds me of Gears like Gears One and Two. Remember how brown and just kind of well, dark. It's funny you say that because this is the studio that brought us Gears of War Judgment. I know. Another the under- last big game that they did. That's not true. Bulletstorm was. Okay, it's the last big game they made <laughs> that we talk about. <laughs> but the writing in the, the writing in fucking Outriders, you can absolutely tell this is the team that made Bulletstorm. Mm-hmm. After writing, about 20 dude. minutes, that was uh, our friend Ray and I's takeaway. Dude, look, this game... This game is like a game that's pretty much... It, it feels like a game built for me where, like... Okay, it, it feels like Gears if it, in, a, in a way. It's a cover-based shooter. I love Gears. I'm a big Gears fan. Uh, it's got loot in it. I love Destiny, obviously. It's got a story that you don't have to pay attention to, and you can just turn a podcast on while you're, you know, shooting grotesque bugs and... and God, ain't that the truth. God, dude... I'm not, I'm not real far, but I've been just playing about an hour a night the last week and a half. And uh, that giant spider boss in the in the volcano is like, I fought it on World Tier 6 for like an hour last night. And I'm like, were you doing it solo? Yeah, I was. Oh, well, that's part of your problem. I know. I, I'm not. I was like, I refuse to turn my World Tier down. It took me an hour and 12 minutes to beat the spider boss on World Tier 6, but I did it. 
I will tell you right now, there is no shame in turning down your world tier because it really doesn't fucking matter. I know it doesn't. It matters um, to me, man. It matters I, to me. It mattered to me, too. I, I refused to budge and turn it down at all. Though I finally turned it down for a boss fight quite a bit past where you are. Quite a decent amount into the game. Uh, definitely past the halfway point. Probably around the two-thirds point. That nerd generalist and I were just unable to do. Even with him being at level 30 and me being at like 22. Mm-hmm. Um, we were unable to do it. So we uh, we turned it down to world tier 1. We mm-hmm. went from world tier 11 to world tier 1. Mm-hmm. He one-shotted the boss with a shotgun. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, I didn't even get a shot off, and he just popped her. That's funny. It was the funniest thing I've ever seen. That's hilarious. One one shell did, like, 400k. Wow. It was absolutely gorgeous. Wow. Uh, but the reason why I bring up Outriders, Josh, I, I've been playing it a lot, but th- there are... The game has its fair share of problems, and I know that the, it has the inventory yeah. wipe uh, issue going on. Mm-hmm. I have to tell you the one thing I love about Outriders is marking the gear that you want to dismantle and just holding Y down to dismantle all your marked gear. I I absolutely agree with that. That's like the one thing I'm like, man, can Destiny please do something like this? Please. Or let me like, I don't know. I don't think they have a, they don't have an auto delete function. Mm-hmm. But like that's been brought up many a time in Bungie and Destiny chats that we sorely need that mm-hmm. and man i i have had my inventory fill up so many times in outriders mm-hmm. so many times and i just have to sit there and dismantle or go and like sell i do wish the button input was a little bit quicker because sometimes i gotta click it a few times for it to recognize that i want yeah. it selected yeah, I, I have really to, hate that. I've had to mentally go and like mentally change the way I like press buttons in games and be like, okay, hover uh-huh. over it, wait like half a second, and then press the button so it recognizes it. It's 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 annoying. I do agree with that. It's not great. No, no. But, but I've also hit way worse. Yeah, this is this is like a this game is like the perfect seven. It's fun. It's fun to mess around in. And I'm having a blast. And I don't know if I'm going to finish it or whatnot, but, like, <coughs> it's it's fun right now. And that's, you know, during Guardian games, which are, in my opinion, not fun, this is a good good way to spend that time. I'd rather be playing Outriders than playing through Guardian games. So, okay. I don't hate Guardian games. As much as I did last year. It's still not great, but it is leaps and bounds better than last year. I will I, say that. I agree. I just like, I'm just, I'm kind of over it. The contender know. card bullshit is still, so, it's some absolute bullshit. Like, I thought mm-hmm. it was going to be kind of fun. And to be fair, like, I think it is. But it should not in any realm be easier for me to do a platinum card than it is for me to do a regular card. Right. Like, uh, Colonel Panic and I were playing some Nightfalls earlier, and we're like, why would we ever do anything that isn't for Platinum Medals now? Like, that's what we're, gives your class the most progress. That's what gives you the most progress towards bounties, towards the Catalyst, everything else. Like, why on earth would I do it? We'll do it elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Like, I hate that one of the shaders for the event is locked behind. You have to do 45 Bronze Medals, which means 45 Crucible matches, regular strikes, or Gambit matches. And I don't hate myself enough to do that it's fair i really don't and so i'm like yeah i hate this because i like great i like earning all the physical rewards from an event like this but i'm absolutely not doing it here yeah i don't know i like i'm just like i don't have enough time to do a lot of this i started doing some of the uh seasonal challenges instead and I actually... Uh, that's honest. You're way better doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just want to get the bright dust and get some of the stuff that's in the store and that kind of thing before the before the season changes in a couple weeks. But uh, I actually started a war... I, I played through the new light quest as a warlock. Dude, that new light quest sucks. I don't remember... It's not good. I don't remember if I talked about it before I went on break or not, but dude, 
I mean, I, I know you I know you played through it, but I played through it now and like dude, it makes it, it dude, it, we make fun of Shahan. There's even more of a reason for me to make fun of Shahan now. He's the worst. He's the worst. There's a mission where you literally have to save him. And it's yep, like it's it's bad. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad I'm through that, and I'm part way. I'm playing through the campaigns again with my warlock just to play as a warlock. And Forsaken, let me tell you, Forsaken minus like the beginning kind of bounty stuff that you have to do for Spider is a great campaign. I yeah, I I really like the campaigns. I just wish that there wasn't like as much fluff in some of them. Were there, like, certain missions <clears throat> were actually strikes? Like, I think that's one of the things in Forsaken that I would complain about the most is I feel like some of the barons should have been strikes instead, especially the one where you have to go in, um, what is it, uh, Trickster? Yeah. That uh, that makes the copies. That one, the one where you go to the Ascendant Plane, um, and then the Technomancer, the, the second to last one. I feel like there's an opportunity for, like, three or four of those to be made into strikes. Yeah. Um, but th this keeps going back to an issue that I raised with the vaulting of vanilla D2. And that's that when you lose those campaigns, like new players are first off going to be confused, but I'm also really nostalgic and like to play through that stuff. <clears throat> and I just, I don't know. I guess I just don't understand why this had to happen. Like I get their explanation, but you look at how massive a game like ESO is and has never had to pull anything out. Mm -hmm. Maybe give me the option to give me the option if I want to keep these campaigns in or not. Mm -hmm. Like, let me delete the extra language packs. Like, from what I understand, like the language packs are actually all, like a lot of what takes up the space in the game. Right. And like the cutscenes, like give me an option to to download those or get rid of them. Like you're mm -hmm. concerned about file space. And I get I understand and respect that in a way. But. I think taking out the Leviathan was more than enough. Like that was yeah. there for a story reason. I get why the planets are gone for a story reason, but let me have those controlled instances for these strikes. Right. Because like, strikes, the crucible maps are still there, right? The crucible maps for those planets are still there. So I don't know. I don't, I, it's, it's, I think it's I, I think they made a bigger deal about it too because you can clearly see there's a lot of reused assets. I mean they reuse them in clever ways, but that should keep the file size down too, you know? Like the, the asset reuse. You, you know? would think so. But I don't know. I, I miss some of the older stuff that's gone. Uh, I'm not gonna lie to you. But, I miss uh, I do miss the campaigns. Mm -hmm. I missed going in like in D one and doing daily stories. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, uh, but that's okay because Corey, we have a lot to look forward to. Yeah, speaking of old things that are coming back, Josh. Speaking of of old things that are coming back, Vault of Glass, baby. Woo! I Vault will... of Glass, May twenty second, ten a.m. Pacific. Yeah, yeah. The vault is open again, my friends. It is. I'm excited, man. I'm like we. And we're to... on Venus. There's no fuckery of us starting on Europa or starting on the moon. I know like we because all we thought. talked. We talked about this what yesterday? I think we were. Uh, yeah, you and I like, were literally talking about this last night. Yeah, because we were talking about the splicers, and we were thinking, well, maybe the splicers are trying to get Vex Tech from the vault, and that's yep. how we get in because we got to stop the splicers. Nope, going in on Venus. Fighting Atheon, there's no, like... I mean, they're going to change some stuff up inside, obviously, yep. a little bit, but, like, it's Vault. It's it's Vault. <laughs> so, I, so I've so i seen a lot of people complain about this already, going, oh, my God, it's of the same story. Who? Blah, blah, Ooh. blah. Bungie told us they were going to change things. Well, the one time they changed things, I want to note this, the one time they changed it, which is the Omnigul strike, they changed it to being Navoda, and fucking Shahan is narrating it instead of Eris. Everyone hated it. Everyone hates that strike. Every single person. There, there is, there's no redeeming factor to that strike. I avoid it like the plague right now. I would rather go do Fallen Saber or Sepix Prime because I have those D1 memories and because it's the exact same thing. They've changed it up in some ways. Like, there's fucking Briggs in Devil Slayer now. And let me tell you something. On a Grandmaster Nightfall, they're a pain in the ass. Yeah. But 
overall, I'm okay with it staying the same thing because it is paying homage to where we've come from. And it just it leads into my whole thing of strikes should always be in there because those are really – that and the campaign, those are your stories. The raids really don't tell that much of a story in all frankness until you start diving into the lore. Like on a surface level, they don't tell a huge story. Deep Stone Crypt is one of the only ones, and even that's kind of half-baked at best. Crown of Sorrow, half-baked. Scourge of the Past, half-baked. Like Last Wish, maybe you're only one in the game that tells a legitimate story of why you're there. Right. And so I'm okay with this. Vault was one of the things that always, even as you progressed further through D1, it always stood off by itself because it was really the only major Vex thing we had. Right. We had a handful of strikes, but that was the only raid, that was the only story content, etc., that was related to Vex because so much of vanilla D1 ultimately became the back half of that story is all about the Vex and the Black Garden. Right. So I think this makes a lot of sense. I like this. That kind of confirms to me that a lot of the rewards are probably going to stay the same. There's no way you do this without having uh, Atheon's epilogue in it. Right. Yeah. There's no way that you do this without having Fatebringer. Or... Um, I, if I had to wager, I would bet that the armor is going to end up being the vault armor from number one and that the prestige ornaments are probably going to be the... the... Uh, some moments of triumph armor, right? Or maybe that's the base armor, and there's something different for prestige. Like I, they're gonna have to have something that does that for you. Uh, and I, I want to read exactly what they say here on the blog post. Uh, blah 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 blah. Uh, Vault will launch with contest mode enabled for 24 hours, which means you will be 1300 power to be at the cap for all the encounters. Should be more than easy enough if you have played at all this season. Um, that was the soft cap, or that was the that was the hard cap for this season, right? With thirteen ten being the pinnacle cap. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> clearing vault with contest mode active is the first step to access the new challenge mode in the director and the tempo's edge triumph. Completing tempo's edge, a curated list of triumphs in this newly unlocked challenge mode will be how a fire team crosses the world's first finish line and claims their prize. So you have to clear it twice if you want to cl claim world's first on. On this yeah that is a great idea in my opinion i yeah. think that's great and you have to do those specific triumphs on your second run through right. to enforce the triumph requirements in challenge mode your team will wipe if you fail the success conditions during each encounter so i think that this is great i really 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 enjoy that i love uh, watching like i'm gonna I'm, I'm really gonna be interested to watch the challenge mode in this one specifically just because this is the first time they're doing that, right? Because, like, yeah. it, this, we're unvaulting a raid. We're changing up, you know, worlds first. I want to see what the challenges are. I'm, yeah, I'm excited to see what those challenges are. Uh, they say challenge mode and tempo edge will only be available for the first 24 hours, and then that node will disappear. The encounter challenges will become available again later in the season. Uh, I am very interested to see this. So before we go too far, though, we actually have a question about this. We do. Colonel Panic wrote into us. Colonel Panic. Our, castles on Twitter. Our, our good friend, Joe Wilson, Colonel Panic. Angry you know him, you love him. You should check it out on Facebook. We checked those show notes for him. Yeah. What do we think the challenge mode for Vault will be like, is his question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fantastic question, actually. Okay, uh, so let's go over the encounters real quick for Vault. You have... Yeah. You have the jumping puzzle... You have the, uh, I forget what it's called, but where everybody, <laughs> we all stood at the top while one person ran around with, like, killing the oracles, right? Like, so you have you you have the opening encounter, which is outside, opening right. the vault. Oh, yeah, well. You have that, yeah. which is a completely controlled uh, instance now. No random guardians will come through in it. It is a closed instance. Um, you have the initial jumping puzzle down, which isn't really so much of a puzzle these days. Um, it's just a really long ways down if you fall. Yeah. You have the Oracle Room, uh, which is the first place where we ever picked up a relic. It's literally called right. the Relic. Right. Um, after you get through that, you have the Gorgon Maze. The you maze, have the Jumping yeah. Puzzle. And then you have, I forget what the pre-Atheon encounter is. It's been like five years since I did Vault. And uh, then you have Atheon. It's the... Uh... 
where you like you have to stand in the the kind of like outside you stand in the rings and yes, then you yes, send yes, the yeah. teams with the relic to cl- like you have to cleanse while you're killing the oracles to make it to the end right Something like that. And, like, yes. one team goes to Venus and one team goes to Mars or something. Yeah. Or Earth yeah, or yeah, Mars yeah, yeah. or something. So one, te- one team, is, you have the home team and you have the away team. Mm-hmm. Um, Because we used to be able to cheese that. Mm-hmm. You used to be able to pick who went and then it became randomized. Mm-hmm. Um, challenge mode, I would imagine they're going to, I don't know. Maybe they'll dump some extra. Cha- they'll jump. They'll dump extra champions in during it. Um, maybe modifiers will be on. Like I imagine, match game will probably be one eventually. Yeah. Got a raid with match game. That's gonna be terrible. Yeah. Um, it's not extra enemies, impossible. extra shields. Um, you think there'll be I champions of- down in the Gorgon maze? Oh, there's absolutely gonna be fucking unstoppables down there. I wonder if you have to kill the the gorgons in the gorgon maze uh maybe for champion for contest mo- or not contest mode maybe for uh, challenge mode you have to yeah. yeah i could see that being something because it was possible to kill them you mm-hmm. just didn't get anything from them and you had to do it real quick yeah i would imagine with some of these new supers or not just new supers but new exotics with the supers like the thunder crash one mm-hmm. for example if you have falling star on you have two titans right thunder dick smash it then you know, you might be able to take it out. You have a couple Celestial Nighthawks or some Chaos Reaches. Like, that would be really cool, I think. Like, if that was one of the secret triumphs was you had to kill all the Gorgons. Yeah. Um, I would imagine one of them is probably going to be finding Praedeth's corpse. Yeah. Um, I could see that being one. There, Not just finding it. You, you're probably going to have to examine it or or, mm-hmm. some, or take something to it or something. Right, I could see that being something, but like they hide it like in the middle of the maze or something. Like the maze is probably going to have several things in it, right? Because that's the most obnoxious thing to get through. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it'll be drastically easier now that we've done a ton of raids. But when that first came out, I was like, "What the fuck is this?" Right. Um, I imagine there might be some stuff hidden uh, when you get teleported to uh, the other realm when you're in <clears throat> Atheon's throne room. Right. And I mean, of course, and like champions, like they've teased champions for the regular one, though. Like, I can't imagine you dropping the regular raid and not having champions in it. Yeah. I wonder if everyone's going to have to hold. Like, remember in. uh, What was it? The the Golgoroth uh, challenge where everybody had to like be like do everything in that in the Golgoroth. I, I wonder if everybody has to hold a relic in the Atheon or in the um, uh, part. Before. I don't know if everybody will have to hold. I could see I could definitely see that like everybody has to do it for the oracles. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could see that being one. I think the Atheon I think doing it in Atheon would be a little bit just too chaotic. But doing it during the oracles would be a way that you can't. There's no way they haven't patched it to where you can't stand up there and just shoot down. Yeah, there's no way they haven't patched that by now. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine that is probably one because I mean that's that's been a mechanic before in a raid, right? In uh, Valkalor, yeah, in Inspire of Stars, everybody has to pass the ball real, and then you have to dunk it. Like I could imagine you have something like that. Like the game is like mentally keeping track of who has it. Like maybe you get locked out from holding the uh, the relic. Yeah, a la Deepstone Crypt. Like I think there's a lot of things you can do there to aren't bad but are just annoying enough that an unskilled team won't do it the first day Mm -hmm. which is the whole point of uh, world's first right like we hit that with deep stone crypt where it was really aggravating on that first day like we got hung up at eight tracks like everybody else we came in the next day and just like wiped the floor with them once we all had lament Mm -hmm. and we got past that and the last two encounters were cake right but it would have been a gigantic hassle to try and do it day one. Like, I, I won't lie. Like, I mean, trying to knock down Tanix that second day was still a challenge, but we did it. Right. And, like, Atheon is going to be very similar. Like, if you get it done in the first day, congratulations. You are one of the best PvE players in the game. Do you think there's going to be some sort of secret behind him? I know we kind of speculated on that before. 
like up the stairs? You think there's going to be something? I think there has to be. Right. I would honestly, I would love it if that's where the final chest was. Yeah. If they put it up there and like the first team to like clear him gets Atheon's epilogue out of it. Yeah. I think that would be really cool. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I, I'm curious to see how they dole that weapon out because that's going to be the most sought after exotic in a hot minute. Mm hmm. Uh, because so many exotics have been tied to quests or to the season pass, we haven't really had anything we've had to hardcore chase in a while that's an exotic. Yeah. You know, you, you get the raid exotic each year. Uh, I mean, Eyes of Tomorrow is a completely random one. I would like to see this one be a quest because it's such a beloved exotic from Destiny 1. Right. I'd like to see this one be a quest. And because it would be the only. No, I'm thinking of something else. I, I'm thinking, oh, God, I've been misspeaking. So Atheon's epilogue is the auto rifle. I'm You're thinking, talking about Vex uh, Mythoclass. Mythoclass. God, I promise I was not drinking today. I'm just really tired. Uh, Vex Mythoclass is what I keep meaning to talk about. Mythoclass, I can't imagine them not making that a exotic quest like yeah. Divinity. Yeah, I'm not saying like every single raid needs to do that, but I think a healthy balance of that and ones that are RNG would be useful. Like I like that Divinity because it's such a useful gun is it's not RNG gated, mm -hmm. but you have to do a shitload of puzzles. I could imagine doing some of those challenges would give you uh, Vex Mythoclast. Like, or like you have to maybe them, like, the maybe you do the quest to get the gun and get uh myth class and then you do the challenge mode to get the catalyst uh i would i would definitely see that as something mm -hmm. that could happen i just don't know if they'll throw a catalyst in that quickly because you figure they would only the people who get through challenge mode on the first day in the first 24 hours would have the catalyst to like a very tiny percent of the population until you bring challenge mode back later in the season mm-hmm I would say that's almost a damn near guarantee is in challenge mode. They'll have some specific puzzles to do. And at the end, you'll get rewarded with some exotic items or some special armor ornaments. Yeah. I, I again, I think it would be really cool if they rewarded you with the uh, the year one or the year three moments of triumph armor. Yeah, I remember that armor looking really cool. You're talking about when they brought all the raids up to power like a uh, well light level and. and it yeah, was like during the... um festival of heroes or whatever it was the lead up to destiny 2 right yeah like the back half of rise of iron when they did that that's mm -hmm. when i came back in to destiny after taking a break since taken king and i remember that happening because i went through vault with some people i went through crota's end a few times i think i did king's fall one more time uh, and all those armor ornaments were really really cool it gave incentive to run them again and my hope is that if you're going to do this, because they've already said challenge mode is going to be a thing for all raids and dungeons going forward. I I want to see cosmetic rewards that make it worth my time. Yeah, I think I think ornaments is the, are the best way to do that. I think locking sure. weapons behind it is a really shitty thing to do. Mm -hmm. So like like you said, maybe the catalyst is mm -hmm. one of the things. Like you get the catalyst from beating Avion. Mm-hmm. Because I see almost no way Vex Mythoclast is not going to be a quest-based gun. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I mean, what was the shotgun you got from Leviathan, the Legend of Ac Acrius or Legend whatever? Legend of Acrius. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something like that to where, like, you get the gun and then to, like, mm. you know. It's not as powerful. Yeah. It's a, for, ooh, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Like, uh, Acrius was kind of obnoxious. Like, I think it, if you did that, it would just be like, oh, you need to go complete it again to get the full gun. And then for the catalyst, you need to complete it on prestige. Yeah, and yeah it would be more fleshed it. out. It would be a more fleshed out version of that idea. I would like something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I like that. Yeah. I just want you to be able to have the gun at normal power. And not just this bullshit of like, oh, it can only hold like one round at a time or something like, no, like, give me give me the weak version of the gun. Make me go do a quest and like complete vault again at the end of that quest line or something. Yeah. And then give me the full powered gun. But like, be yeah. like, oh, you're really going to want the catalyst for this. Or like, 
entice us to go do challenge mode. Or like maybe like the exotic Kvostov quest where like you have the gun yeah. and then you do the quest and you get the, the like the more powerful version or the exotic version or whatever. Would it be cool if they dropped it as a, as a legendary first and you made it an exotic by doing a quest? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like if yeah. you go and do the quest. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be really, really unique to do. Uh, I would like that. It's funny because Nerd Colonel and I floated this a couple weeks ago about in a raid if they or if we brought uh, we made legendaries into exotics, for example. Um, Like, would people be upset? Like, we floated it with falling guillotine. Like, if guillotine was made an exotic, could we give it back its normal amount of damage? Like pre nerfs. Yeah, I mean, I, f- I feel like there's a way to do that without, like, completely... Well, without taking a dump all over the player base to, like, grind it out for yeah. a good roll. Yeah. You know, because it's just grinding out an exotic then. And then you can still have, like, the legendary version of it if you want to use an exotic somewhere else, right? Like, maybe they just... Mm-hmm. You know? I don't know, it'd be weird to put a switch on a weapon and be like, whoa, well, we're turning off the exotic status of this weapon. You know, maybe you just get the exotic version of it. Like the like the swords in, in Ting King, yeah. right? Like that, almost. I would love to see a quest line like that again. Mm-hmm. I like that, oh god, dude, what if that, le- mm, I'm getting so many thoughts now. I really want the <laughs> legendary weapons back, though, because I like Atheon Zeplog. We all love Fatebringer. Mm-hmm. A Vision of Confluence, uh, which was one of my most used guns. What in about Destiny. what about Icebreaker? Uh, so I, I mean, I guess I'm talking. I'm talking like specifically vault weapons. Oh yeah. Uh, I I always I, think of that as a vault weapon because everybody used it in vault. <laughs> Icebreaker, in, in my opinion, Icebreaker is the one exotic that they will never ever bring back because it would simply break the entire game if they did. The way D2's economy is for ammo, I think that gun would just simply break everything. We, I mean, we saw it in uh, in the tail end of year one when you paired year three icebreaker with uh, any sidearm, really. Right. In trials or in PvP, that was it. That's all you needed. Yeah. That's just... And there was that one... Uh... I forget what the sidearm was called, but it was like a burst. It was like a burst sidearm where it shot like three or four shots every yeah. time you shot it. And like you paired that with icebreaker and everybody was just like, I remember that's why my friends, half of them played trials and that's all they used. And the other half were like, I'm done with destiny because <laughs> this yeah. is terrible. But Corey, unless we got any final thoughts on vault coming back, we're going to move on. That's we fine, because we could talk about Vault forever, you know. We, well, we, we really could. And we're we're going to talk about Vault more as we get closer and closer. Uh, for those not keeping track at home, uh, myself, uh, Nerd Generalist, A1 Johnny, and Colonel Panic are planning a day one attempt of the Vault. Uh, three of us have done it before. The other three guys on our team never have. Ooh, uh, that's... It's it's going to be It's going to be spicy. We are very excited. We're really looking forward to doing that. I want to uh, say, though, stream it. I want to say that Vault is not extremely difficult to teach because it is such a DPS heavy raid. I feel like Vault mechanically is not hard Yeah, to learn. Mastering it is something else entirely. Right. I think that I think I genuinely think we've had far harder raids at this point, but there's a reason why Vault is still so high on so many people's rankings. I mean, we we when we ranked the raids, I don't think those of us who had done it, you, me, and Joe, I don't think any of us had it below number four on our list. No, I think it was number three for me. I had it at four or five because I did. I went Last Wish, or no, I went uh, I went King's Fall, Last Wish. Um, God, what was my third one? Uh, I think I went Garden, and then I went uh, Vault, mm-hmm. and that was our that was our pre Deepstone Crypt rankings. I mm-hmm. think I would still keep them the same, but yeah. man, I'm really I'm just so excited to go back. Vault is clearing Vault for the first time is one of my favorite gaming memories ever because it was something we'd never seen in a game before. Uh, I cleared it with some buddies that I've literally played Bungie games with since we were kids. And what one of them is actually going to be with us on the day one attempt, uh, my friend Matt. I'm very excited for it. This is gonna—it's gonna be an awesome time. 
Yes, yes. I am it excited is. to see what the rewards look like, which we won't know until we get in there. Uh, I am eagerly awaiting people to be tweeting me while I am trying to do the first encounter, going, "Oh my God, Fate Bringers back!" Like I, I'm just wait, or like, "Oh my God, look at the armor!" Like because if they don't show us the armor ahead of time, we're all gonna be like, "Oh my God, I can't believe this." <laughs> so, oh, only only a couple more weeks until we figure all that out. But we're the big story this week. Please stream that. I, I will be stre- I will probably be streaming our day one attempt. Assuming that my internet can actually hold up. Um, our big story this week. Weapon buffs. Ooh. Next season. And my god, we have a lot. We have an awful lot here. Yeah. Most of this is sent on perks and on heavy weapons. Yeah. Um, so I jump. I want to jump into what Chris Proctor says here. Um, he says, uh, you know, whenever they think about weapon rolls with heavy weapons, they tend for them to excel in one or two areas. So rolls include add clear, single target damage, which is burning, burst damage for burning a champion or for bosses, multiple damage phases. Uh, how they map those weapons, uh, sword, uh, ammo efficient, add clear, single target, sustained damage, secondary burst damage, uh, but you have to get really close and potentially get stomped out. Rocket launchers, uh, primary for burst, secondary for add clear. Um, machine gun, ammo efficient, add clear, uh, secondary, uh, single target sustained. Linear fusion, single target sustained uh, for crit spot, secondary burst damage. Don't know if I agree with that. Large grenade launchers, burst, add clear, secondary, single target damage. Again, don't know if I really agree with that. And then exotic snipers. <laughs> exotic snipers, remember those? Uh, single target to sustain damage. Um, yeah, they go into how they've used heavy weapons and high difficulty content and their balance philosophy. Uh, big swings make a big change. We believe will immediately encourage new player behavior. Most useful. We need to nerf or buff something hard enough that everyone can tell it's happened with the expectation that we may need to dial the tuning in a later release examples, 120 hand cannon buff and beyond light or the rocket launcher buff in season of the chosen. And then incremental changes, um, something we feel isn't far off from where it needs to be a nudge it a little bit at a time. So uh, precision auto rifle change that we're going to outline here in just a second. Or season of arrivals, high impact pulse change. Uh, in most releases, we have both types of changes, which we choose for a given feature. It depends on how much time we have to test and iterate on a change. How many changes are already in a release and how close we think a feature is to being balanced. So weapon archetypes that they are going to adjust this next season I, I apologize a lot of this is just going to be like weapon archetypes i encourage everybody to read along with the Schwab uh if you're listening to this because, read along kids read along yeah it is going to go into a lot of depth i'm not going to cover it too extensively i'd rather save that for some of the weapon perks um that we all know about but uh precision auto rifles which are 450 rpms so when we say precision uh, precision auto rifles. We are talking uh, your uh, your shadow price, for example. I love shadow price. That's so it's one of the nightfall weapons uh, this season. I, I got the adept version. Uh, range. It's a uh, range masterwork, and then I've got the adept range uh, mod on it. So it's I completely maxed price. out. I love Shadow Price. Uh, I like it a lot. I was using it in Crucible earlier. I know it's not an optimal choice, but it was going pretty good for me. Um, increased precision auto rifle damage per bullet from 17 to 18. Uh, it fell behind in auto rifle tuning last year, so damage has been increased to be closer to time to kill of the others. That's great because that's that's one of the complaints is you can't do enough damage quickly enough because it is like it's very it's a very stable uh, subclass or subfamily of guns. It's like Shadow Price, like, I was shooting people across the map, like, duh, 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 duh. and if they're unaware, that's great. You can kill them in a couple bullets. But if they're coming right at you, you're probably going to die every time. Uh, there's some stuff about rares in here. Y'all can read that on your own. Uh, the big one here is linear fusion rifles. Unpopular choices in PvP, largely because other weapons do their intended job. Single target sustain damage better or more efficiently without the requirement of landing all precision hits. That's exactly why I don't like to use them in PV, uh, PvE content. We want to keep linear fusion rifles focused on precision damage, but decided to increase precision damage to make them more competitive and increase reserves to give them more staying power. Uh, 
we have seen the suggestions to move some or all linear fusion rifles out of the heavy slot, but this is a substantial amount of work and a balance risk for PvP due to the difficulty of balancing snipers as instant shot weapons against LFRs with charge time. With wildly varying flinch and aim assist values, reduces weapon diversity in the heavy slot. It is still a possibility for some time in the future, though, if tuning them as heavy weapons does not have the desired effect. So I want to focus on that real fast before we get to the changes. I'm one of those who has called for them to be moved to the energy slot. I'm infinitely more okay with this explanation here. Yeah, I always wondered why linear fusion rifles were not there, but... I mean, this. I mean, it makes sense reading this, right? Like, I, I would say, look at how much we had to nerf the shit out of Arbalest this season to right. make it viable to stay as a primary. Right. Um, the buffs that they give it are increased precision damage by fifteen percent. Great. That's hu- and, that's huge. That's like that's a huge buff. Fifteen percent. I'm very curious to see how that plays in PVE. Right. Uh, and increased reserve ammo by 20%. This, for me, is the bigger one. Because that's one of my major complaints about linear fusions is it you have about the same amount of ammunition, if not slightly less, than the average sniper rifle. And they're just not viable. But with these changes, I'm like, okay, I could see myself at least attempting to use a linear fusion next season. Yeah. But still, I'm, st- I'm already looking at this and going, I still have so many other choices. Like... Now, if I want something precision in that heavy slot, I probably will try to choose this, but I also already have Xenophage for that purpose. Which, you have to aim Xenophage a little bit more because of the kickback, but I can also just hold down the trigger and keep doing sustained damage if I use Xeno. Right. This makes me think that a Xenophage nerf is coming in the future before the Witch Queen. I feel I feel like that which sucks because that game, that weapon is amazing. <laughs> It, it never leaves is, never leaves my heavy. It's and I think that's part of the problem. Like it's such an obtainable weapon too. It's mm. a best in slot weapon that is not that difficult to get. It requires some effort or you to read a guide. But it's not. I mean, you can you bad. can cheese it. Like the only thing you have to do is fight that boss when you get there. Like when uh, Mitch and I ran it with Willow. Willow ran us through the cheese, and it, you like run around the map. Like it, it, it's like the the cheese isn't hard, and even if you want to do it legit, it's still not that difficult. Doing it legit is a piece of cake. I've done it legit several times. It's it's yeah. not a problem. the The hardest part is honestly doing the puzzles leading up to it. If you don't want to read a guide, that is genuinely the hardest part leading up. To yeah. It. Um. But again, like it's a solid day's effort, and you'll get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so excited to see what they do and what this means going forward because I do think they're going to end up having to pull these out of the heavy slot eventually. Mm -hmm. But like they say, that's going to be an awful lot of work and you risk upsetting the balance. Mm -hmm. So I could see them taking linear fusions entirely out of the game while they work on that. Uh, Because I mean, the the usage rate is not high on these to begin with. Let's be honest. Yeah. I I mean, I really only, I really only use them to get my gunsmith bounty and then I like, I don't even do that. I just skip it at this point. Yeah. Well, you and also have a lot more materials and things that I let don't. Let me tell you, <laughs> them dumping that fucking linear fusion from this season into my inventory as many times as they have has made me never, ever want to touch a linear fusion ever again. <clears throat> yeah. I'm good. I'll pass. Forever pass. I will pass. Pass. Um, the only other class that we're getting buffed here they, they talk about fusion rifles really briefly. Uh, recent buff to fusion rifle ranges had the side effect of making the best subfamily for PvP high impact even better. So we've decided to bring lower low range stat fusion rifles up a fair bit. Uh, increased damage fall off start distance for fusion rifles. No effect on 100 range stat plus 2 meters on 0 range. So kind of curious to see how this works. Maybe it'll be, you know useful for something else uh some other fusions will be used because right now the only fusions i really see running around in pvp are jotun of course and mm-hmm. glassiochasm mm-hmm. uh even glassiochasm i don't see too often i might see i might see it like once or twice a week mm-hmm. uh but it's really like it's usually like higher end players like players who have gone flawless that i see using it um every time weapon, i every time i see 
Every time oh. I see the the word fusion rifle, I just think Telesto, and it just haunts me forever. Oh God, yeah, I do see the occasional Telesto, um, <laughs> and I get really worried that the game is just going to break on me. Oh, I hate Telesto so much. <laughs> not that it's a bad weapon. I mean, it's it's not amazing, but it's it just man. I there was a point where I was trying to grind out some stuff, and the only exotic I got for like two months was a Telesto. Like every single exotic that i got was a telesto and i'm like oh my god please stop (laughs) the the meat of these changes though is in the perks the perks of the weapons right um again we're gonna go over a handful of these um i'm not gonna go over all of them like in depth you can read about we can read up on them or you can send in questions for next week and we'll go over uh some of the concerns that i have about some of these but Let's start off with one of my favorite perks. I really like this perk. I didn't like it a lot until this season when I got it on Dead Man's Tale. Subsistence. <clears throat> so, subsistence is one of those interesting perks. It's one that, like, as you land hits, you get ammo refunded to you, but it pulls it from reserves. Uh, and I, w- I really want to read their explanation here on this one. When we made this perk, we were experimenting with unusual downsides for powerful perks, but ultimately decided reducing reserves wasn't an interesting trade-off. We also wanted to be able to put the perk on special and heavy weapons where reducing reserves would feel terrible. Submachine guns were granting a much smaller magazine fraction than auto rifles, so we fixed that at the same time. No longer does does this perk reduce reserve ammunition, and SMGs now receive the same ammo fraction per takedown that auto rifles do. Was 10%, like most weapons, now 17%, same as auto rifles. This, for me, instantly becomes a desirable perk on most guns, especially on precision weapons. Right. I love this change. I am just weeping tears of joy that I have a Dead Man's Tail that has that exact role on it. I am oh. absolutely thrilled. You lucky son of a gun. I've run... That, sh- that mission so many times and I still have to say that I think subsistence is probably my favorite role that I've gotten on it and that was before these changes um, it was that or snapshot and I just think that's fantastic um, high impact reserves and under pressure due to technical constraints at the time these were created the trigger condition for these is on projectile impact but we have more flexibility in park activators now and these are now active as long as their conditions are met I like, again, I really like that. I'm a big fan of high impact reserves and under pressure. Um, I just felt that they were never executed properly and there were definitely more desirable perks. Uh, Unrelenting. This was hard to trigger in difficult combat or content and the health awarded was hard to perceive. Now easier to trigger in PVE. Immediate trigger on majors and heals 20% more. Sympathetic Arsenal isn't appealing enough for many players as it is, but useful in niche situations, so we decided on a small buff to sweeten it. Now grants plus 20 reload in addition to its primary effect. Uh, Again, kind of like this. I've been playing around with one uh, with that perk on my trusty. Uh, I've got Surplus and Sympathetic on one of them. Uh, Excited to see how this works, especially because I tend to pair that with uh, an SMG in my primary if i'm running that or with um i know this is heresy but running a pulse running double primaries uh dragonfly it always bugged us dragonfly wouldn't proc on every enemy you could finish with precision hit now works on heavy shanks and servitors and occurs even faster than after the season of the chosen fix i love this i there is no more fun perk on a gun than dragonfly especially if you have the dragonfly spec mod I, I really enjoy this. Uh, you guys can go read about Hipfire Griff. Um, they did buff it a little bit, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at you. Let you guys read that. There's a lot of numbers and a lot of technical crap there. Uh, Iron Grip, gaze and reach from the uh, Iron Banner weapons. Uh, we were cautious when making stat bump perks in Season of Arrivals, not wanting to break weapon stat ranges at too low a cost. These pe- the penalties these shipped with were too much now that we've seen them out in the wild. So instead of the stat penalty from being negative 40, it's down to negative 30. Um, I do think that makes those weapons a little bit more appealing. Um, I personally still really like using my auto rifle that has... Uh, I want to say it's Iron Grip on it, is what I have. Uh, I haven't used Forward Path in a little bit, 
uh, just because I was playing around with other weapons and other auto rifles. But I do really like that in my primary slot, and I believe it has iron grip on it. Osmosis and Elemental Capacitor. Um, I would encourage you to go read that um, because Osmosis now switches weapon to Stasis Damage when playing as a Stasis subclass. Um, I think that's really cool. And an Elemental Capacitor with a Stasis subclass grants recoil direction and reduces ADS move speed penalty. I think that's good. No distractions because of an exotic change below in the sniper rifle flinch changes. We want to make sure no distractions is a more appealing option for combating flinch. Uh, reduced trigger time from uh, 1.5 seconds to 1 second and increased flinch resolution from 30 to 35. We've already talked about the celerity and bottomless grief uh, perks, but here they are again. Celerity will grant plus 20 to handling and 20 to reload in addition to the triggered effect. Bottomless grief now always grants plus 30 to magazine in addition to triggered effect. Please uh, remember that these are alternate perks on adept weapons and cannot be applied retroactively. Um... Yeah, yeah. These these are these can't apply retroactively uh, for adept weapons, um, but I do believe they can apply retroactively to the regular drops. I don't know though. The wording is really weird on that. Uh, and then the thresh change is already up. Mods, um, adept mag targeting and counterbalance all got some changes. I encourage you to go read those. Um, there is a change to meet a multi tool. For exotics, the Catalyst perk will be changed from Outlaw to No Distractions. If you have the Mita Catalyst, congratulations, because you've hit Legend in comp at least once. Um, and then Hawkmoon increases priority of Paracousal Charge and Shot Buff Text, sometimes dropping off the bottom of the list. Um, but beyond those immediate changes, we do have a little bit about the future. Um they are going to look at shotguns overall because they want more weapons to be viable on all maps, and they can achieve that through tuning, giving other special weapons room to excel. Uh, that will be later on in Season 14. Dead Man's Tail is also going to get a bit of a nerf, uh, they tell us. They have a change ready to go that reigns in the ability to challenge sniper rifles, 120 hand cannons, and scout rifles while in hip fire without detracting from the fantasy of the weapon. Because, I mean, right now you can basically just aim, you can just shoot without aiming and get headshots with that gun. Um, yeah. And then fusion rifles, ask some of our other changes. We don't want to bump these too much too fast, so we'll follow up if needed. I think all of these changes overall are really, really good for this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most of these are needed, especially for me, the big ones, like I, I'm interested to see how the linear fusion ones play out. I'm very happy about the changes to subsistence, uh, dragonfly, and the iron banner perks. Yeah. The, uh, uh, the dragonfly perk is going to be. Ah, awesome. that's going to be spicy. Yeah. That's going to be real spicy. I'm excited to mm. see that. I'm excited to see how osmosis and elemental capacitor play now. Get your so milk. It's going to be spaces. spicy. Do what? So get your milk. It's going to get spicy. It, it is going to get spicy. Uh, yeah. There's just, there's not a, like, there's a lot there to take in, but it's one of those, like, I would encourage you to read over this list and to kind of brace yourself. If you maybe if you like some of these perks and you'll have a whole lot of weapons, you know, maybe this is the time to go get them <laughs> with a couple of weeks left in the season. Or uh, if you are enjoying something that's going to get nerfed into the ground, keep enjoying it because uh, like Fell Winters, they're coming specifically for Fell Winters. Yeah, uh, dude. Every time I enter the Crucible, especially some something competitive, it's it's Dead Man's yeah. Tale and Fell Winters. That's all anybody ever uses, or like you know, some sort of hand cannon. That's I hit igneous hammer every single match. Mm -hmm. That's the trials hand cannon. I hit that. I hit palindrome a fair amount. Um, I don't actually encounter dead man's too much. Um, thank God it's usually people on my team using it, mm -hmm. but I don't encounter it too too much. I hit one twenty hand cannons like nobody's business though. Um, but again, like I, I still think the weapon meta is in a really, really good place overall. Um, I think it's abilities that need to be reined in a bit. We already had the stasis nerfs, although I've had the worst time of my life playing Crucible the last couple weeks. It gets genuinely the worst Crucible has felt to me since year one of Destiny 2. It's the least fun I've had. Ooh. So I'm curious to see if I'm going to keep feeling that into next season or not. It's just genuinely, it is, it's been awful. I don't know what's changed, but something has changed and it feels terrible. Uh, it's been specifically during Guardian games. Yeah. So, 
Um, I am looking to see if there's anything else in the Schwab that we need to cover, but I don't think that there is. Um, some very minor fixes and a hot fix that went live today about Guardian Games stuff. Um, are the uh, are the I haven't really checked in on Guardian Games this week. Are the Hunters still like blowing everybody away? So the Hunters won the first six days. Uh, tight or warlocks won the next two and as of right now i'm actually loaded in the game i'll go to the tower right now to check i believe at the time of this recording hunters and warlocks are almost neck and neck for day nine um honestly like if the hunters get to 11 wins it's over mm-hmm. uh, it's at the very least it's more competitive than it was last year yeah we're Hunters won the first day, and then Titans won everything after. Yeah, I just remember the Titans kind of like uh, blew everybody out of the water last year. So, yeah, the way the classes were weighted last year, like they had so much bonus percentage given to them. We we had heard there was going to be bonus percentage given to whoever came in last, uh-huh. but I don't actually know if it's happening. If you want me to be completely honest with you, uh, so in the tower, Hunters are ahead by just a little bit. Uh, about the same as it was earlier, but it's it's real close today. Mm-hmm. Um, if that, oh, excuse me, hunters have won seven days, not six. They've won seven days, so this is actually day ten of the event. Uh, so they need to, if they win today, that would require winning three more to seal the deal. Cool. So, and it's entirely possible that technically they have already sealed it. You know, if warlocks and titans split the rest, right. every day, every day that a hunter wins from now, that hunters win from now on, makes it that much harder. Right. So, um, I'm going back to the Schwab, seeing if we have anything else on here. I don't think it we doesn't do. look like there's much. Just the community stuff and. Uh, they, they do say at the end, uh, keep your eyes peeled next week for more info on the coming season. So I expect we'll finally get the name next week. We may get the uh, seasonal calendar. The season of the sexy, um, which is what everybody's calling it. <laughs> season of the sexy. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, there was uh, there was data mine uh, <laughs> on the Bungie website that said uh, that it was going to be season of the splicer, which we did not dive into last week. Um Corey and I talked about it uh, offline, and uh, I talked with Nerd and Colonel about it a bit in game chat. But Bungie went in and changed that after that leaked, and changed it to Season of the XXX. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> people have been calling it Season of the Sexy. It's funny I, I, if they I, want to. I think it's pretty funny. Yeah, I mean, like, oof, Zavala, don't uh, don't flatter me too much. Oh boy, everybody now everybody's going to predict that Marasov's coming back. Is that, is that how this works? Oh, dude, I would love for Marasan to come back. Hmm. I mean, Destiny ne- needs something to compete with uh, Resident Evil 8's giant vampire lady. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> I Oh, okay, so I, this is not Destiny related, but the NFL draft is going on. I have it going on on my other screen right now. Um, I have a friend. One of my one of my very dearest friends in the world, Aaron Morris, is a diehard Bears fan, and the Bears just traded up to number eleven in the draft to get uh, Justin Fields out of Ohio State as their new quarterback. He is Upset? losing his ever loving mind right now. He is is incredibly he happy. Oh. No, he is stoked. He wanted. To, he's been begging for this. Hmm. Hmm. Um, interesting yeah well I mean when your choices are uh, your choices are fucking Mitch Trubisky or uh, Big Dick Nick Foles then uh, you know and you, and you got you got absolutely led to believe you were going to get Russell Wilson at some point and did not then uh, after a whole I don't know, lifetime of disappointment, the QB spot. I guess this is what it's like to be excited. So I'm happy. I'm happy for them. Uh, I think Fields is going to be a really good quarterback. I'm excited to see how he develops. But congratulations, Aaron. We love you guys. I just, I really hope that the Browns don't blow their 26th pick. 
God, the Browns have, the only time the Browns have ever picked that high is when they traded up to get back into the first round. Because <laughs> they're usually in the top ten picks. <laughs> oh man, there's your sports minute. Check out trash talk. Yeah, there's you there's your sports, sports minute during the Guardian <laughs> games. Yeah. Hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna try not to pay any more attention to the draft while this is going up. Seahawks that's aren't even in the true. first round, so I don't know why I care. That's not true. You're gonna pay attention. <sighs> we do have another question though. Before we get to the lore corner, tonight, we, we have another question. We do. Uh, from from Galatrad, what is the most powerful and spectacular class in both combat and story? Why is the correct answer Titan? First off, first off, it's not Hunters. Let me tell you something. It's not the Hunters. We do have some of the most legendary Guardians, but not the ones who have done the flashiest things necessarily. So we're going to take Hunters out of the running. There are a lot of Titans in the tower right now. There are a shitload of Titans in the you got, tower. You There's got too Z- many Titans in you the got, tower. You got uh, uh, Zavala. You got Shax. You got Saint-14. You got Saladin sometimes. Who am I missing? Uh, Drifter. Yeah, you got Drifter. There's a lot of Titans, man. There's a lot of Titans. So... There's a lot of Titans, but uh, I think if you're looking at the overall story, I, you can make it. I think, like, logistically, for for story purposes, I think it's Titans. Um, I, I will acquiesce to that because, like you said, like, look at who all you have in the Titans corner. Like, and this is just people in the tower alone Salad and Shaq, Zavala, and Saint. Mm-hmm. And then Drifter, who is kind of like. I would say kind of a, a combination of like all three, but you have those four, those four, four of the most legendary guardians of all time are like the heads of your class. Like, I don't know if you can really argue with that, honestly, in terms of like, I mean, whether it's your Nova bomb, it's your chaos or each. Um, I mean, like even just if we're going like canonically, like where the story is right now, I mean, you look at the things that Osiris does when his ghost dies. You know, he takes the last burst of light from Sagira. And it's a shame we never saw this scene play out in the game, but he uses all three subclasses, like, at once. He's hurling Nova bombs. He's using lightning. He's, you know, summoning flames. Like, you know, he's summoning uh, Dawn Blades. Like, that is something that I could only ever hope to see play out on screen. Uh, it's almost as glorious as the Kate six cinematic where he's using golden gun repeatedly and throwing, sh- um, not, I keep calling it shards, but uh wave a thousand cuts mm-hmm. and he's bloody barraging people. And it's, it's weird because I think when we talk about combat, we have to consider like how the classes play right now, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> like how do they play with us? Like in regards to super, supers only uh, supers and abilities only. And for me, honestly, I think it goes. I think it goes warlocks, and I think there's a drop off to titans and hunters. Um, and I would even give. I would even probably give a, like slight bias. I would probably give hunters the slight edge there, just because they have more varied means of combat and supers and things like that. When it comes to actual story power, though, um, I don't think there's any arguing that it's titans. Mm-hmm. Like you can make you can make an argument for warlocks. Um, and there, there is no argument to be made for hunters. I mean, it's literally it's Cade, Andal Brask, and Tallulah Fairwind, mm-hmm. um, and uh, well, my boy Shin Malfer, uh, literal creator of the Golden Gun. But I don't know. Like I, I think, especially for recent Destiny history, like the two hundred years preceding where we are currently in the story, it's absolutely Titans. I think as you go back a little bit farther, you know, that's when you get into the stories of Andal, Tolua, and um, Shin, especially. I think you can make an argument for another class if you go back farther, but really, since Battle of Six Fronts, it's been mainly Titans. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, Hunters, they have Ana Bray in their back corner. Um, Ana was one of the legendary ones at Twilight Gap. Mm Mm-hmm. But I don't. I don't know. Like Corey, Corey, what do you think? I need to hear from a Titan himself. What do you think? I mean, I think in terms of story and just the way that they're kind of, you know, 
just the way the story has played out so far and the stuff that we know from the lore, it's it's definitely a Titans universe, it feels like, you know, with you know, with with uh even in like Rise of Iron, you had Saladin's story with the initial run up to Destiny Two, you had all those cool cutscenes with Zavala and how he, you know, was building building the wall and, and uh you know, you go back to Six Fronts and, and Twilight Gap and all these other stories that you hear about, right? Like uh it it's been I would Titans. argue until I would argue until Destiny Two it wasn't really a Titans world. I think it was I actually think Hunters had a pretty decent amount of the spotlight in Destiny One. Uh, because I mean, we were the only ones who we had a vanguard with a personality. Well, yeah, I, yeah, know, but I mean, like, I Kate, mean, in terms of Kate lore, and Eris. I meant in terms of of I the mean, lore. I didn't mean like the story in, in the terms games. of the lore. Well, I mean, even in terms, I mean, if we're going to go into terms of the lore from Destiny One, I think especially it's Hunters because that's when we first got some of the backstory about the Last Word and about the Gunslingers, which that's. You know, that that's Shin Malfer. You have Marcus Wren, who's, you know, the creator of the Sparrow Racing League. You've got, you know, Shiro 4. You've got Cade 6. We have the story of Andal Brask, you know, getting the revenge on him for uh, being killed by Tanix. You've got Tallulah introduced for the first time in the lore. You Eris Morn. Like, Cade and Eris literally carry two, ex- two or three expansions out of this whole thing. That's true. In Destiny 1. I mean, Cade pretty much carries so the can, entire like, game by himself. Right. I mean, Cade's the yeah, only one with the I personality mean, could, at all. Right. You you can definitely make, like, I think on screen, you definitely can make the case that the Hunters absolutely, and even in the lore to an extent, absolutely carry Destiny 1. Mm-hmm. But I think Destiny 2 is where it gets a little bit more muddled because, you know, we get we get the backstories of Zavala, Shax. We learn a lot more about Saladin. You know, we hear about, uh, what's his face? Shax's days as a warlord. Mm-hmm. You know, that was just introduced. You know, we learn more about the uh, the Iron Lords. We learn about well, Fellwinter was. I, don't remember, I think Fel, Fellwinter was a warlock. A war, I want to say it's a warlock because the warlocks have Fellwinter's helmet as an exotic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I think when you take all that into consideration, I think Destiny One, it's definitely. I think it's Hunters. Destiny Two, I think it's Titans. The Warlocks have always existed in the middle. Like they've never been the best, but they've never been the worst in terms of like carrying the actual story. But those that they have, I like think... Ikora and Osiris, are absolutely, without a doubt, two of like the probably the three most powerful guardians to ever exist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm like, really excited we, to see you know, we know about Osiris. come back. By the way, yeah, like Osiris runs circles around everybody basically until he loses his light mm-hmm. Ikora like literally holds what is it the all time record in the crucible I think canonically mm-hmm. like Ikora is an absolute killing machine mm-hmm. like I, I don't know I and that's not me saying like oh Zavol was not like I mean Zavol's the tower commander like you have the, the titans have to have the tower commander yeah, and but... they have to have the heads of Crucible and Gambit in their corner. The thing and is, trials. The thing they have is to too, have the heads of everything in their corner. To be to be the leader though, you don't have to necessarily have to be the most powerful or the you know, the strongest or like the most intimidating, right? Like I I could probably name three or four guardians more powerful than Zavala, right? Like as as, as, as out of what we've seen, you know. Saladin, probably Saint Fourteen, probably uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, Icor and, and uh, Osiris are probably probably way more powerful than Zavala, right? Like, I, 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 definitely I personally think... would say so, yes. But Zavala's tower commander for a reason, right? So, so like when it comes down to it, in terms of in terms He's of the Lance story, Rick, so overall funny. story, I think. It could be pretty close between all three classes, frankly, if we mm-hmm. really start digging into the war. But yeah. I mean, I think I, I think, think like, a lot of people, as far as what most what most players are going to outwardly see in terms of NPCs and what's on screen, it's absolutely going to be perceived as titans. Mm-hmm. I just think it's like whatever class is your favorite, and you're interested in the story at all, you're gonna yeah. you're gonna look up. Oh, well, these are the important titans let's go see what their story is about you know i think i think that's kind of how it is too you know 
like and I kind of like I, I like I like that you said it that way because it's like you know I can sit here and make the case for the hunters because you know I, I've dealt I've dived into so much of the lore and what happens off screen like the reason why you don't see a whole lot of hunters in the game is like they they die they mm-hmm. die in the field like mm-hmm. they are the they are the scouts they are the ones who are charting kind of these I don't know uncharted waters you know titans are the defenders of the tower warlocks kind of fall somewhere between mm-hmm. and i think like when you start digging into some of the some of the hunter backstories it's absolutely fascinating you read it i mean like yeah sure okay they're giving they're giving us crow okay cool like i don't care <laughs> crow crow's not tech he's he's a hunter but he's not uh I swear to God, if you guys take this away from me after giving him a cloak, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to I'm going to literally drive to Luke Smith's house and complain with a megaphone. To be fair, Crow looks cool with a cape. Crow does look cool in a cape. When can I get his cape is my question. I mean, could you imagine him with a Titan chess piece? No. No, no. It would look like he has fake boobs. Yeah. He'd look like Shah Han trying That's to cosplay a right. Titan. <laughs> oh my god. Oh god. Hunters can't win. We have fucking Shah Han. We can't Yeah, win. you automatically get negative five points <laughs> in terms of ranking for that. Hawthorne has a better story than the Hunters now because the Hunters have Shah Han. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> I don't even I don't want to talk about it. We're gonna move right on ahead. We're gonna Corey, we're going to shift into the lore corner. Lore corner. Lore like corner. That? that was my song. I don't have a I don't have a fun jingle for it. I don't I'm either. I'm a little upset. I don't either. That's fine. So, it's fine. Lore corner this week. I had said that we were going to do we were going to do two pieces, and I've I haven't decided if I'm going to read the second piece quite yet or not. I don't know. Well, let's see where the first one takes us. and then we'll. we'll... Yeah, we're going to see where the first one takes us. I'm going to see how I feel about doing the others. I wanted to do some Guardian game-specific lore this week and next week. I meant to start it last week, but we did Anarchy instead, and I I really enjoyed reading Anarchy, uh, considering how we think that the the Fallen are going to be playing a big part in the upcoming season. And speaking of Warlocks, Ikora is going to be back in the, the story starting here in two weeks. So excited to see how that one goes. This comes from the Color of Speed Sparrow that you can earn in Guardian Games. I believe it's the one you can get from a tri- yeah, it's the one you can get from the Triumph uh, for earning class points. And it's it's the thing you have to unlock in order to get the uh, the track jacket from Bungie Rewards. But the flavor text says, after a certain point, speed is a matter of willpower. Petrovenge. Eva Levante threads a needle with fine white silk. A lone lamp lights the wood green of her table and the length of handsome black cloth in front of her. She only touches this garment at night, when her small flat in the last city is shrouded in secrecy. With each stitch, she recalls the strange encounter some months ago that prompted her clandestine work. It was late in the evening. She had been walking back from the tower, nearly home, when she heard a smooth voice quietly assert, Eva, it's been too long. You look bright as ever. Osiris melted out of the shadows near her doorway. The ex-outfitter snorted. That's faint praise coming from someone who's been 50 for several centuries. My age shows in other ways. May I come in? Of course. She opened the door and noticed how he looked over both shoulders before he crossed the threshold. It's good to see you back in the tower, Osiris. Eva watched him out of the corner of her eye as she put the kettle on. I take it you're not here on official Vanguard business. No, I'm not. I'm here to ask a favor or contract your services, whichever you'd prefer. Osiris perched uncomfortably at the edge of her couch. Eva smiled. His regalia looked a bit absurd set against the mundanity of her cozy apartment. I'm always happy to grant a favor to an old friend, even if I'm the old one now. She examined her self-serious visitor with a gentle gaze. What do you need? A custom hunter cloak. Something that resembles the feathers of a crow. I'm sure there are plenty of outfitters in the tower that would do a fine job gave up on custom outfits years ago after my fingers started to go. She massaged her knuckles reflexively. I need someone that I trust. Someone who can keep a secret. Osiris fixed her with his inscrutable gaze. If you agree, a ghost called Glint will come by later to help choose the fabric. A secret cloak? 
this is just the type of thing Cade used to come to me for. In fact, the last hunter cloak I sewed was for him. She drifted off sorrowfully and poured the tea. Now, months later, she puts the finishing touches on the requested garment. The black fabric soaks in the meager light, highlighting the delicate white silk. It's as fine a work as she's ever done. Eva can't help but wonder who the new cloak is for. Who could warrant such secrecy? She just hopes it will be worn by a hunter as worthy as her last. That, uh... I didn't expect to get that from a sparrow when I read that for the first time. Yeah, that's... Uh, uh... I read it. I read it yesterday when I unlocked the sparrow, and I was like, uh, "This this has to be one of the ones that we talk about tonight." Yeah. Um, to hear Cade get brought back, and it, it's funny because it continues this relationship that Crow has with items from events, you know, dating back to the dawning from a couple of years ago, um, and even back to Black Armory, like the how his story keeps getting told and. <laughs> ever well not ever verse items necessarily but sparrows and ships and class items and i think that's surprisingly touching like a nice callback to kate and osiris trusts eva enough to make this for knowing that she will she won't sit there and talk about it that it's you know it's a secret thing she only works on it at night um this also confirms something that i wasn't entirely sure about that it seems like eva is not a guardian Mm -hmm. that she is simply a civilian and I mean I, to be fair I have not read her backstory that you can get through here um, she's one of the few people at the tower I don't really know a lot about but she's a tower I grandma just she, just bakes, she, had a, she just bakes cookies I assumed that I assumed Christmas grandma had a ghost <laughs> and uh, to find out here that she doesn't it that's kind of an interesting like, wink and nod as to why you don't buy shaders from her anymore uh, is because you know, she's too old to be doing that. Like, yeah. Do you think they would ever kill her off, like, of old age? Maybe. Do you think, like, in Lightfall, she's just going to, like, die in her sleep or something, and there's going to be, like, a funeral in the tower? I mean... Is that too dark to think about? Man. That's going to be the se That's going to be the final seasonal event of Destiny 2, is Eva's funeral? <laughs> No, and, and it's uh, still going to be a lot of bounties. She's really Savathun. She's just luring you in with her cookies. If she was secretly Savathun, I think I would fucking quit. <laughs> I would quit because I can't see space. I cannot see space grandma go out that way. Come on, that's hilarious though to think about. <laughs> she it is hilarious. You. I'm not arguing with that. Instead of like space magic, she just I lures like you it. in with cookies and and paper craft masks during Halloween and. <laughs> yeah. I don't like it. I'm not a fan. Unsubscribe. <laughs> the uh, the other piece that we have comes from the uh, comes from the uh, the hunter cloak. Um, I, I like the uh, the class items this time around, and uh, we're going to read the other two next week. We'll read the Titan Mark and the uh, the Warlock Bond. Um, but the Cobra's Hood says, I never did find that horn, dot, 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 Lord Shax. Prakish sat on his gray hornet, parked in his usual spot at the base of the tower. The former guardian was watching bootleg transmissions of the latest Cabal death matches when one of his runners tugged on his sleeve. Prakish jumped in surprise. Son of a drag, don't sneak up like that. He smoothed his fur vest, his fur vest in self-placation. Sorry, sir, the kid scuffed his feet sheepishly. Just that some guys want to make a bet. Prakish sucked his teeth in annoyance. So take the bet. What the hell are you hassling me for? The kid ran his grubby fingers along the sharp black lines of the bookie's ride. They won't give me the chip. They said I gotta talk to you direct. Prakish swatted the runner's hand away. I just had that detailed. He sighed in exasperation. Fine, send them over. But if they end up making some lame prop on the new Hunter Vanguard or something, I'm gonna run you over with this thing. The kid nodded and scampered off. A few minutes later, a fire team of three hunters sauntered over. Prakish slouched further on his sparrow in a dramatic display of nonchalance. His ex-crosshair enforcer, Tolnik, cracked his knuckles. The hunters posed coolly in front of the bookie. The team leader, a gunslinger, casually flicked a knife between his fingers. I guess you've probably heard of us. Prakish glanced at Tolnik, who shook his head. Uh, not really, the bookie said. Now what's this about? The Arkstrider stepped forward menacingly. Show respect, you're talking to the Death Dealers. Prakish raised an eye. Cool name. I once had a cat called Death Dealer. Behind him, he tore Tulnik Guffaw. 
<laughs> the Arc Strider snarled and sent a crackle of arc energy rippling through his arm. Before he could strike, the Night Stalker blinked in front of him and put her hand on his chest. Whoa, cool it, Gene. He's not worth it. Remember your breathing exercises. The Arc Strider nodded. You're right, you're right. He's not worth it. He retreated, put his hands on his head, and walked in circles around the plaza, exhaling loudly. Prakash cleared his throat cautiously. So you want to make a bet, or... You're damn right we do, the gunslinger replied. We're betting on hunters to win the Guardian games. Hunters rule, shouted Gene from across the plaza. Is that all, Prakash asked with confusion? That's stock standard. Why didn't you just put in a chip like everyone else? The Night Stalker leaned in conspiratorially. Because of what we're wagering, she said, and opened her pack to reveal a single curling horn. Prakash's eyes went wide. Is that whose I think it is? The crossed his arms smugly. You tell us. How did you even get this? Never question the death dealers. Now what's it worth to you, the gunslinger said. Prakash shrugged. Hunters win gold, you get one legendary hand cannon each. If not, I get... He dropped his voice to a whisper. The horn. <laughs> Throw in a couple umbral ingrams that Night Stalker countered, and you got a deal. Prakash pretended to consider. It's a deal, he finally said and recorded the transaction in his data pad. Good luck in the Guardian games, hunters. Hunter's rule, shouted Gene to nobody in particular. <laughs> I think this is fantastic. Yeah. That finally answers the question of Shax's, Shax's horn. horn. <laughs> I get the horn. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> I absolutely love it. Um uh, that's just going to be this the thumbnail for the episode this week, by the way. It's just Shax's horn. <laughs> oh, my God, dude. I would absolutely love to just get the backstory on it one day. Like, if there is a backstory, I'm not really aware of it. If I, like, I am, I'm trying to think back if I can remember anything. Um,. Because it, it's, I don't know. It's always been gone, right? Like it's been gone for yeah. It, well, so the only time that we've ever seen him with both horns is in the trailers leading into Destiny Two when he's with Zavala, right? Building but a that's, tower, we see him that, with both helm. That's be yeah, but that's like pre Destiny One stuff still. The only the other tower. things that we know is right. The only other things that we know are that uh, Ikora did whoop him in the Crucible once. Yeah. Um, if I was a betting man, I would say it broke off during uh, Six Fronts or during Twilight Gap, and he used it to uh, melee an enemy with. Yeah. But I'm still very curious as to how they found it. Like This feels like something that's going to get explored later on. For, for the record, I have not read the other two uh, pieces. I have not read the, the Titan Mark or the Warlock Bond yet. So it's a very... We may still get the story, but I thought this was really amusing, and it was kind of a nice bookend from uh, the uh, unexpectedly emotional Sparrow reading that we just got. Right. Where I didn't expect to really, I don't know, feel anything. Yeah. This uh, this this was really nice. This is and it's kind of goofy. Like I expect the other two will be funny as well. Yeah. Uh, so I, I like I, I'm curious to see what happens. Like this is this is what I want to see in these types of events. Is like, give me some lore that like it builds the universe. Like there's there's guardian bookies. Yeah, right. he's a bookie that used to be a guardian. Like he, he's just like lounging on his sparrow. Like this is hilarious to me. Right. But what's better is we're airing cabal death matches on television. That's Are we like filming the battlegrounds or something? Yeah, right. I like to think that Shax is like, I like you know, Zavala is super serious and Saladin is super serious, but like in a really commanding like leadership way. Whereas Shax is like super serious in like the most comical way ever. I mean, my other thing is, did he break off the horn and give it to Marasov? <laughs> Did Hunter steal from Marasov? Maybe. I don't know. I don't 
So I th- this is fun though. This is the kind of stuff I like to close out seasons on. Is uh, stuff that's really lighthearted and funny because uh, next season is probably going to start to climb to the Witch Queen. Yeah. If I follow the pattern of Worthy or of uh, Joker's Wild, so I'm a little not apprehensive. I think apprehensive is the wrong word to use here, but. Um, by the end of the season, things are going to be getting dark again, especially yeah. for that season leading into the Witch Queen. Oh, so yeah. this may be one of the last like lighthearted things that we get for a while in mm-hmm. this uh, in this story. Yeah. So a Guardian bookie, I think, is a great way to go. I do know the other two reference him, so I'm very excited to see what happens. I uh, can only hope that you know maybe Osiris and Saladin or Saint make some uh, some guest appearances. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that does it. Yeah, that's uh, that was a that was a good, good uh, almost ninety minute show. It was awesome, Josh. Thank you for joining Definitely me tonight. Feel like. It. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for being back. Yeah, it's good. It's good to be back. Good to get my uh, dip my toes in again, as they say. So. I want to thank everybody for listening and or watching this episode of Tower Casuals. Remember to like, subscribe, share, rate, and review wherever you consume the show. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify. Join our Discord. Email us questions at towercasuals at gmail.com or tweet at us at Tower Casuals. We'd really appreciate it. Josh, where can we find you? Uh, Twitter and Twitch at Josh underscore Finn with two N's. As always, I'm on Twitch a lot less these days because I'm very busy, but I'm hoping to get back to streaming sometime soon. Yes, yes. Uh, you can find me at I am Corey HD on Twitter. Uh, that's about it right now. That's about it in here on Tower Casuals, hosting Tower Casuals. It's been <laughs> real fun. Uh, again, Josh, thanks for joining me tonight. Thank you guys all for joining us. Thank you so much for watching, and until next week, we love you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye now. <laughs>